So hi, I'm Jake. I'm I'm recently uh, dual affiliated. I started a job at uh, Google. So Google opened up a research. I know that Google is swallowing everyone now, mm -hmm. and I'm just another. I'm this is a boring story at this point. But they opened up a research office. A research lab actually in Atlanta, only about six blocks away from uh, Tech Square, Georgia Tech. Um, so it's been it's been interesting and fun, although a little overwhelming being uh, dual appointed um, uh, and still teaching and having grad students at Georgia Tech. But um, but most of my uh, most of my time is paid by by Google. Um, and of course, it's fun and interesting times um, being an industry researcher um, and exciting. But I do want to start this talk by emphasizing that um, and. I, I was I, I almost forgot about this, but then I was talking to um, Guy last night at dinner and was reminded that I actually started my career at uh, Harvard Square. I was a um, professional juggling entertainer at the age of 19. This is actually what I wanted to do with my career was comedy juggling shows. And I started actually in Harvard Square uh, trying to get a crowd and have them give me money after a 25 minute show. Um, and it's not as common, I guess, these days, but in 20 years ago, there were entertainers that would spend a lot of time in Bridal Square, right out of the T there, doing shows. Um, so you guys don't remember this, but I, I'm from Amherst, Massachusetts, and then I moved to Acton, Mass, where my dad lived, which is just out in the suburbs here. Um, and um, I'm also the founder of the MIT Juggling Club, well, for the student version of that, and um, sort of started that. But anyway, anyway I tell I this to my you. students at the end yeah. of a semester, emphasizing yeah. that if you know they didn't get an A in the class, they shouldn't worry. I wanted to be a professional juggler in my career, and this was the backup plan. Um, and um, it, it, it's sort of a joke, but it's also sort of true. Um, I did try to be an uh, entertainer after undergrad, and it didn't work, and then I went to grad school as a result. So, um, and I did have some, I had an opening act for Dave Chappelle when I was an undergrad uh, at, uh, at UMass. I spent two years at UMass, two years at my, oh, thank you. Guys, it was 20 years ago. I've had half of my life since then. Come on. Um, so but people, I shouldn't say, today. what's that? You're the opening act. Yeah, I, well, I, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> I, I don't it's usually start at 9 a.m. though, the opening <laughs> acts. But, um, I, sh I don't like to start my talks with this usually. It's a special case because we're in Harvard Square, but people then expect me to be funny. And I'm, the funny is going to stop very soon. So don't expect much from the entertainment value of this talk. Um, I also mentioned this at the end of the semester for my students also. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about game playing. It's interesting that when I started my PhD, um, people thought of machine learning. I mean, the sort of the way that machine learning was entering into computer science was uh, very different than it is now. Well, I guess the thing I wanna emphasize is, is that um, people really thought of machine learning is like solving problems like, you know, detecting cancer and, um, you know, the, the kind of the IID model was, was sort of the standard one that you're just trying to make predictions on an exterior exogenous process that you have no influence over. And now machine learning is used for solving chess and getting into your iPhone. I mean, security protocols, and it's like this sort of this sort of adversarial view of machine learning has become much more popular. And now the algorithms are designed with, you know, GANs. You have minimum over pipe, uh, generators and maximum over detectors, and it really it's an interesting world. And when I was in my PhD, I was always trying to like emphasize how we should be thinking about machine learning more in terms of um, adversarial processes, and that was not really a popular idea at the time, but it's become much more popular. And I think reinforcement learning sort of really took it, um, you know, really brought that around, but also kind of the applications in, um, you know, I guess this is, I guess maybe four or five years ago, um, DeepMind was able to beat, um, what's this game? StarCraft was able to win StarCraft. And um, so that's exciting. Um, and I'm just gonna emphasize that, you know, I've been working with solving zero sum, get using kind of this, how to solve zero sum games. I know it feels like an old problem, min-max problems. How do you how do you solve min-max problems? Seems like an old problem. And I'm gonna give you a new set of twists on that problem um, using some tools that um, you may know about or you may not know about. Um, and I was, this is an idea that I started working with with a student about seven years ago. And um, I think I should have given it up by now, but for some reason we keep finding new applications and I'll show you a number of those. Um, so just to give you a sense of like where game theory has entered sort of the 
I would say, machine learning foundations of machine learning space. The first time this, I think people really heard about zero sum games and von Neumann's index theorem entering in to machine learning was in boosting. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, I assume we've all heard of, heard of boosting, add a boost and these well-known boosting algorithms. They have an interesting, I mean, once it was the, the way that the algorithm was originally written did not feel like there was anything game theoretic about it, but there's this sort of, you're trying to estimate, find a hypothesis that predicts y from x and um, you kind of do this reweighting on your data trick you keep reweighting your uh, your data set to make some ex examples that you're mispredicting harder to predict uh, it, you, you emphasize them so that the the um, you know the you're, you're trying to make the, the objective harder and then you keep finding these weak learners um, a Freud and Shapiri discovered that actually you can frame this whole thing as essentially solving um, a midnight problem and it was a bit surprising when they published this a few years after the original Adaboost paper uh, that you can frame this as a game, as solving a, uh, as solving a game. Um, and I teach this to my class every, uh, every year because um, it really does give a nice story for what, what's going on. And, I'll, and I'll, I won't talk much more about boosting, but I'll give you other examples of this. Uh, I've been working on, because I have a paper on midnight on fairness problems where you're like trying to, you're trying to do, come up with a good predictor um, which does well on the hardest distribution. So I guess it's maybe you might call this session. We call this, people call this fairness, but it's really just min max, min, your min over hypotheses, maximum over potential um, classes. This could be like, you know, populations or um, categories of your input data. And um, you want to have the predictor that works best on the hardest class. And that's, again, it's a, it's a natural min-max problem. And we actually, you know, have this sequential iterative algorithm where you sample from the hardest class and then use that to do an update on your hypothesis. Um, and that's sort of the right algorithm, sort of iterative algorithms where, you know, you kind of are doing the min-max procedure um, in sequence. Um, this is kind of the, the one of the tools we're going to use. Um, the perceptron algorithm, I don't know if you've, I mean, it's maybe the first learning algorithm that existed, sort of been, sort of been forgotten a little bit today. Um, but you know, it, it's in some sense the most beautiful algorithm. You have a weight vector that you're learning. That um, you're, so you're learning a linear predictor, binary classification, and on every round you get an example, and you just check: does my current hypothesis, if I take the inner product with my example, does it have the same label sign as my label? And if it if it if it uh, has a different sign, then I actually just add my um, y i times x i to my hypothesis to my weight vector. And this simple algorithm, which is like something you can explain to kids, um, has a guarantee you can prove that this algorithm, uh, you know, will converge with a small number of steps to, uh, to, uh, to, to, a, to a perfectly working predictor as long as one such exists. That was the theorem of Novikov, I think from the 60s or 70s. It's from one of these papers that is very hard to find uh, online, but um, this is like a, almost a folklore result in, in learning theory. Um, okay, so I mean, what well, it turns out what I mean, just to give an overview of what we can show and to give a sense of kind of these ideas, you can like take a lot of these algorithms and um, there's sort of a standard view of them where you, you know, people have had this, they've sort of designed these algorithms separately and in, with different techniques. Um, but once you kind of get them this framework that I'm going to show you, um, you can sort of prove all of them using the exact same techniques. Basically, they all look the same once you write it out this way. Um, but you can also get these accelerated versions. And I think that's the kind of the cool extra power that you get from this story, which I'll uh, hopefully give you some sense of is the kind of acceleration becomes much clearer. Uh, if, you, okay, if you haven't heard of acceleration, um, you know, everyone for a long time, everyone knew that kind of grading descent gives you certain types of rates um, and, you know, minimizing like a smooth function, you want to minimize smooth function, you know, you get a one over T rate. Every if you do gradient descent on this thing, then the last iterate converges at a rate of one over T. Um, and I think there was like even a debate. Well, the lower bounds have one over T squared, but the upper bounds have one over T. And I think people thought, well, it's one over T, we just don't have a good upper bound, uh, lower bound. But actually, no, it's one over T squared. And Nesterov <laughs> solved this in like 1982 or something. And it was a huge surprise at the time. Like, oh, apparently, um, and um People have puzzled over it because it's like a very hard to interpret result. And I think, you know, one of the things that we, I think we maybe didn't realize initially is that the, the techniques that we're going to show were sort of give a story behind acceleration and also let you apply it very easily. Um, 
Okay, so I should just give credit to my um, uh, some collaborators. This is actually a sequence of seven and arguably eight papers since I submitted another <laughs> NERPS paper two days ago on this topic. Um, with, uh, well, let me just mention a lot of this work is with my student Jun Kun Wong, who will be faculty at the UCSD and uh, ECE in the fall. Um, and uh, another student, Kevin Lay, Kafir Levy, and Jun Kun and I wrote a nice journal paper, which will come out soon in mathematical programming. Um, and um, and I've also you know, done a little bit of work with some other some other folks. And, and recently, Wang Hui Wong, who's a new student at Georgia Tech, has gotten into this stuff and has made some nice progress, which I'll hope maybe we'll have time to talk about. Um, OK, so um, let me just give you a high level, high level point, which is that um, in vanilla convex optimization, the standard, I'm going to switch gears to something which is going to be a little bit confusing. There's vanilla convex optimization where you have a fixed function f. Um, and at every round, you update some iterate x, t. And you update that iterate um, with the goal of finding like something close to argument of f of x, um, maybe x hat. And you, you can get access to like either the function value, its gradient, its hessian, you know. And, and your goal is to use queries to these things as an oracle to find something close to argument of f. And that's the standard um, uh, convex optimization objective. Um, then there's another objective. There's another framework for problems, which may seem more complicated, but I'm actually going to argue it was maybe more simple. It should be the should be the base, should be the axiom of this whole framework, which is online convex optimization. Um, it's hard to argue. It's hard to explain why I think this is true, but I do think that this really should be the the um, the core tool, and you can then apply it to this 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 problem. But in in, in online convex optimization, you actually have a changing sequence function. So you imagine every round you get something that is like represents data, but we're going to represent it in terms of a loss function. So L1 is a loss function. L2 is a loss function. L3 is a loss function. And L, LT is going to measure the performance of your choice XT. Um, and you can really think of LT as like maybe the loss of your, and again, think of X as a hypothesis. So even though usually we use X for data, X here is your parameters. So you, you, you have your parameters and L is going to measure your parameters on let's say some data on some, on some example. Um, but you, you can also have L be arbitrary. These, these LIs be arbitrary if you're, if you want. And of course, you know, um, the goal in these online learning frameworks is to is to have the total cost of your algorithm um, be small relative to like a benchmark. And the benchmark is how well could you have performed if you could commit to a single example, a single set of parameters X star in advance, you could have committed to X star in advance. This is what you would have achieved and how, how much did you lose relative to this um, to this quantity, this this benchmark, and that's called regret. We use the term regret there, and um, you know it seems like a maybe kind of an esoteric thing to care about. Like, why don't you just care about your total loss? Why do you have to care about this? And it turns out the regret actually is like the right thing to look at. It's, it sort of contains a lot of information, a lot of um, it has sort of the right has the right properties. Um, yeah. So you have no information. That's, I guess, the, the minimax part of this. Thanks for bringing that up. You have no information about the LIs are changing. Maybe they're bounded in Lipschitz, and, um, but they can change arbitrarily. And in fact, typically, you assume they could be chosen by an adversary or just some other algorithm that's doing something else. That's a subroutine in your process. So that's what sort of makes this a kind of a game theory scenario. You really aren't making assumptions, any stochastic assumptions on the sequence of, of losses that you're getting. Um, OK, so the protocol is like this, the way we um, design these protocols. And, and here, I'm going to need something called weighted regret. But it just you have this additional weight per round, which I'll explain why that's important soon. Um, there's a protocol. Um, you have a decision set. Um, you have a number of rounds, and you have a certain weights per round. And you can assume these arrive online, or you know them in advance. It doesn't matter that much. And you need an algorithm that's going to choose points. OK, so what's the process? The process is on every round t, uh, your algorithm is going to re return some point zt. zt has to be inside of your set z. Um, you receive a, a, the, the, the loss function for that round, which is arbitrary, from some process. I mean, you could assume it's from who knows where it came from, um, lt. And then you also get the weight for that round. And then you just say, what's my total loss? My total loss increases by alpha t times uh, lt of zt. 
So I increased my so loss by that much. But my goal is not to minimize loss. My goal is to minimize regret. And this is what we're going to call the alpha regret, which is the sum of my loss minus the sum of the best loss in hindsight. Um, and oftentimes we use this thing called average regret, which means that we divide by the sum of the alpha. So we're kind of looking at the weighted average of this regret quantity. And this is often the easiest, more interesting thing to analyze is this weighted average regret uh, quantity. So make sure you understand this. This is like, I'm sort of taking the standard convex optimization, optimization protocol and making it a little harder by changing the objective on every round. Well, it's not really, this is the objective, but the thing that you get on every round is, is some, um, is, is some loss function. Now, I'll just emphasize quickly, you can imagine that I can use this protocol to solve convex optimization if I want, by just assuming that the LTs are constant, or maybe assuming that the LTs are just the gradient, it's just a linear function defined by the gradient of the convex function on each round. And that, by the way, is a very standard reduction. I want to solve convex optimization using this protocol. I just LT is just a linear function defined by the gradient of, uh, of the uh, original function at ZT. That is one way to use this protocol reduction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. Why do I have alpha T's? Um, it's actually a very good question and it's it's not a it's not a trivial one to describe now, but it turns out in the future, I'm going to actually use Jensen's inequality to extract as an average ZT. And I I want to have those be weighted. I want the 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 so you notice that here I'm going to have like an average of the well, let's look over here. I'm going to have an average of these things. Oh, sorry. Let me go. Let's let's look over here. <laughs> There's a time when I'm going to have to pull out the average ZT, and I want them to be weighted by alpha t. So even though now you think, why can't I just put alpha t and LT together? It's like I just call it LT tilde, and it's just a different loss function. That's a great question. But for this framework, actually, I am going to use. Forget what you see here. There is more I'm going to use this for. That's going to require me to like have a, a, the weights be different. But that, that is a, a good point, and it's something that it still puzzles me to this day that they sort of needed to add that weights um, to to make this an interesting framework. Yeah. yeah. Here you're looking at regret was kind of like fixed fixed uh, fixed uh, z. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. It of yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, there are many, there's many works on what happens if that Z is changing and how could you get regret perspective. It's sort of not interesting to let it change arbitrarily. Like you could imagine like ZT star. That's actually pretty hard to compete with. When you have like the, every round I have to be good relative to the best ZT, ZT star. That, that's hard, but you can say, well, what if the ZTs change a little bit? Like their total sum of norms doesn't change very much. And you can get regret for it. And there's lots of papers on sort of those adaptive regret bounds. So yes, but they all kind of reduce to this. They all, well, they all use this as sort of a subroutine typically. So, but good question. And I, yeah. I was going to ask because you mentioned Jens that there's a DNA or penicillin is LR. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's sorry. So did I not say that? Uh, the L's almost always are convex. The L's are almost always convex. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I said maybe online convex across sequence of changing. I should have said convex somewhere and I didn't. Okay, shoot. I, that's an important thing to fix on these slides. Uh, yes, LTs are. It's not. It's hard to get results if the LTs aren't in convex. Where this? Okay. So this is just a protocol. Let me. Um. Uh. Let me just you know, give you a sense of the protocol. The standard algorithm to look at is, um, you might call it stochastic gradient descent, but it's online gradient descent. You update your parameters on each round by just moving in the direction of the gradient of the loss function in that round. Um, and this is sort of the classic algorithm for the setting. It's like the easiest one to describe and everyone kind of knows it. And it actually, you can prove without too much work that it has a regret rate of, on average of one over square root of T, if the weights are all one. Um, and this is the kind of, this is basically the reason why stochastic gradient descent is a good algorithm. I mean, stochastic gradient descent, if you know about it, is like, how do you show that, um, if you get like a randomized gradient in every round, why does that, um, and I do a gradient descent with respect to a randomized gradient, why is that sort of almost as good as doing regular gradient descent on the full function, right, on the, on the, the non-stochastic function, if I have a, you know, if I think of this as sort of like a stochastic gradient of a fixed function, you can kind of use this, um, you can use this analysis to show why that stochastic gradient converges actually. So I'm, I'm just making a, a simple point that you can, you can sort of put other algorithms in this framework and get nice results from them. Um, okay, 
So basic result is the OGD fits into this front or is, is an algorithm to apply to this protocol. Um, but there are other algorithms and we can talk about those and I will be talking about those. Um, now, I will just tell you why this, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just step back and just say, philosophically, I was always, okay, basically every algorithm for online comp optimization looks like this, which has always been frustrating. It's hard to come up with to get better rates and do anything better than this. It's actually pretty hard to do anything better than this, which has been very frustrating because like it looks like a harder framework than convex optimization. Convex optimization is a fixed function, but you have all these weird algorithms in convex optimization. For online convex optimization, where the functions are changing in every round, there's not much more you can do other than this. And I'll argue for that. I'm going to argue against that point soon and then show you a variety of algorithms, but they all basically look like mirror descent, online mirror descent of some kind. They're always sort of in that framework of mirror descent. But not every convex standard convex optimization algorithm is a mirror descent. And you get these like interesting rates, one over root t, one over t, one over t squared, e to the minus t, e to the minus square root of kappa t. You know, you get all these interesting rates with convex optimization. Um, and here we kind of get this and we basically get a rate of one over t, one over t. I mean, they're all kind of in the same rough um, range. And I'm gonna answer that question. So this is the point that had bothered me for a long time. Like, why don't we get, well, I'm gonna to try to provide at least a philosophical answer. It turns out that, um, so, you know, last year degree, I was mentioning all these different algorithms. You have like last year degree descent, average year degree descent, the Frank Wolf algorithm, heavy ball, and that's all the story degree descent, all the variants of Nestor. You have all these interesting algorithms that look different if you look at them, they have different iterates and um, do different things in every round. Um, and I think we can argue that actually they're all kind of, um, they all fit into a framework that I'm going to show you. Uh, and uh, they can all be described by, combining not one, but two online commons optimization algorithms. And that's maybe the funny thing here. So the, the punchline of the talk in some sense is that you can get a lot of convex optimization algorithms by combining two online commons optimization algorithms. Um, and I'm gonna show you that point now. Um, and, you know, you know, Jinkun was really the, helped me with a lot of these ideas. Uh, Okay, so here's the high-level protocol. So here, here we're introducing two online convex optimization algorithms to solve this min-max problem. We're just, again, we're, we have a, a function g now. So g, we're trying to do a min-max, min over x, max over g, uh, over y, of g of x, y. We're trying to solve that. We've now gone from a single function, uh, input, a function with a single input to a function with two inputs, and it's convex in x and concave in y. So, so we want to solve, want to solve min over x, max over y, g of x, comma y. Um, that's, that's our goal. And we would love to find a, a point that is approximately optimal in the sense that it is approximately a min-max point with respect to that by uh, two-input payoff function. So the, I'm going to propose a protocol for solving this min-max problem. Um, on every round, uh, you're going to do the following. You're going to uh, ask an online convex optimization algorithm, OLY, um, to give you a YT. This is, again, it's going to, I haven't told you what the online convex optimization problem is, but I will in a moment. And then that online algorithm for Y will, will return your YT. And then you'll say, okay, now incorporate these new losses, HT. And alpha T is the weight for that round. Um, oh, sorry, we're actually, sorry, sorry, sorry. We're going to incorporate uh, alpha T and HT into the online convex optimization algorithm for the X player, for, for the other player. So what, 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 is the, what is the online, so I have two, two of these online algorithms going on in parallel. What is the loss function HT that I feed into the X player's algorithm? Well, I'm going to define it as minus G of dot comma YT. And you'll notice that uh, G was concave in Y. So if I negate it, it's convex. Uh, sorry, it's con. Oh, wait, did I mess this up? Hold on. I think I messed this up. I think I have to fix these slides now. Um, I think this should be positive and this should be negative. Excuse me. Sorry. This, sorry. sorry. G is con convex in X and concave in Y. So it should be uh, uh, positive. Uh, it's fine. Give this talk like five times. I've never noticed this. No one else noticed it. But um, convex in there and concave in there. So it should be negative and, and, and positive. Positive and negative. 
So this so algorithm, algorithm for the X player is going to receive this loss function loss without the negative sign. sign. And then and it's going to give an update XT. XT. And then it's and going, then it's to, going to um, feed into the Y player's algorithm, alpha T, LT, where LT is G of XT comma dot. And of course here I needed a minus sign. So I'm running these two online convex optimization algorithms in parallel and they're talking to each other. They're speaking to each other through the game framework and with using loss functions and they receive loss functions and they output points. And they're talking to each other with G being this facilitator of the game. G facilitates the game and each of them produces points and then therefore gives loss functions to each, each other. Um, and we're just gonna run this protocol. It's a perfectly well-defined protocol. Each online learning algorithm gets loss functions and returns points. And we're just gonna watch, we're gonna let that play out for T rounds. We're gonna say, okay, uh, how did that go? The output of this protocol is the weighted average of the X's and Y's that we received along the way. Um, uh, yeah, it's the weighted average of these X's and Y's received along the way. And you're gonna return that at the end of this process. Okay, I haven't told you why we did this way. I will in a moment, but um, this hopefully answers uh, the question about alphas. And this maybe shows you why I actually didn't need the alphas. The alphas were important. I can't just factor them to the loss functions simply. I would have gotten different weightings if I had done that. Um, any questions about this? This is a like 70% like of the rest of the talk uses this protocol. So I'll come back to it once, but if you have any questions about it, this would be a good time to ask. But how are those alphas chosen? Um, you can assume that they are just provided as part of the protocol. They could also be set by the algorithms themselves, but let's just assume that they're provided as part of the protocol. Yeah. This is very technical, but this assumes that the LT is approximately the same norm. Uh, I think they need to be Lipschitz bounded norm gradients of LTs typically. That's sort of a, you need some control over the kind of complexity of the functions and usually Lipschitz constraint is enough. Um, order of matter or is this like- Order of matter, that's a very good question. And I'm gonna to get to that point. Actually the order kind of matters and that, that's actually a flexibility in this protocol. There's actually flexibility in this protocol and that's one of the sources of flexibility. Thanks for asking. Oh, hi, Andre. <laughs> well, my former postdoc just showed up out of the blue. Um, okay. Um, good. So let's show why, um, why does this provide me with a, well, I'm actually going to show you why this protocol is actually, it's not a protocol, it's a proof of the min-max theorem. Um, and I hope you're going to appreciate this. Well, it's okay. It's it's almost a proof of the next theorem once you apply a very simple argument. And what I love about this argument is that it's a one-slide argument. And I hope I can show you that this is a one-slide argument. It's actually a very simple argument for why the min-max theorem is true for this somewhat arbitrary G. I can show you that min, I can show you that in, in soup can be swapped, essentially, using this um, thing. I guess I need to compact. So you can, the min-max theorem, by the way, is a very general statement. You, you don't even need convexity. You don't, you need like convex in one player and upper or semi-continuous in the other player or something. And then I think you can have unbounded in one play. Like it's, it's a very general state. It's not just like for linear bilinear functions, which is what we teach typically, you know, LP duality, we teach that kind of min-max statement, but actually it's true very generally. I won't prove it in, I can't prove it in full generality, but I can prove it for convex K and uh, this should be an X, con, con, compact X and compact Y and uh, convex K, convex concave loss function or game function. Here's the proof. It's really one slide. Okay, let's analyze the weighted average um, payoff uh, values for this, uh, for this game the weighted average um, uh, uh, values of the game over time where I've gotten the XT's and the YT's from the protocol. Um, if I simply plug in, okay, what, what was, if you recall, what was um, LT? What, what is LT? This should have been a negative LT, of course, or sorry, negative G, but what was um, LT? LT is defined as G of XT comma dot. So I'm just gonna plug in so LT of YT is g of xt comma yt. So I, this is just, I'm literally writing the definition of lt, but this is the weighted average sum of these lts over time. Um, and the only inequality here is that 
I'm going to say that the, um, what, what is, how is regret defined? Regret is defined by saying that the, um, the sum of the losses for the Y player versus the best in hindsight um, uh, should be no more than, than the, uh, uh, the regret for the Y player. Um, that's the, the regret is defined. In fact, this, this could be equality. Um, this could be an upper bound or it could be the actual quantity. But this is just the, the definition of regret is the difference between what the Y player lost versus um, what the Y player lost versus what the Y player um, um, should have lost if they had had the benefit of hindsight. So this, this this isn't even this isn't actually even really you call it. This is the definition of what regret is. Regret is defined as the difference between these two things. Okay, I have this normalization here. Forget that. So the only so you can if you just dereference what is LT, you get this g of x become a y now. So I've replaced this again. This before was yt, but because I'm comparing now is yt here, but now I'm comparing it to the best in hindsight. Um, I, I get this uh, uh, soup over y of, uh, uh, of this quantity minus alpha regret. And the, then the only real inequality here is the instance inequality. The only real inequality is that now I have xt occurring here with these alpha t's, and then I have the normalization. I can just, I just want to pull this xt out and make it a, um, um, I want to put the, I'm going to pull the g, pull this through the g's. So because g is convex, I can pull, did I get my any other inequalities wrong here? I hope not. I hope that I was getting myself confused because of the negative sign of the other slide, but um, I think that this is, this is the correct evidence. Forget the soup for a moment. G of, yes, G at the center point should be smaller than G. It's convex and yes, it's convex in the first coordinate. So it's this against inequality is going the right direction. Against inequality, as we know, against inequality always goes in the wrong direction. So I got lucky this time that it went in the right direction. Um, so the only real inequality here is Jensen. Um, you'll notice that what I have here is that the average loss to the Y player is um, uh, at least as big as, so this is the average gain to the Y player because I'm, the, I have the, the minus sign. The average gain to the Y player is at least as big as the soup over Y of, of, of G of this, of this kind of empirical average thing that comes out of the protocol minus this average regret thing. And of course I can replace the X bar T with, this, with the worst X instead. So I can go from X bar T, which is the weighted average X to the worst X and I get in soup of G of X comma Y minus the regret, the average regret of the Y player. Okay, I was long winded, but I'm just trying to make the point that there aren't actually very many steps in this proof. It's really, the Jensen's inequality is the only interesting step. Um, and otherwise it's just the definition of what regret is. But you can apply the exact same argument to the other side of this with the X player. You go through the same sequence of steps and you get, I mean, I, I can repeat it, but I'm just going to say it. You get the average uh, uh, loss to the X player is less than the soup over Y inf over X, G of X comma Y plus the regret to the X player, um, plus the average regret to the X player. I'm just applying the same argument. I haven't done anything interesting. I can just flip the signs and flip the orders and and, and get the exact same argument. And the key thing is that I've now analyzed this thing on two sides. So if you combine those two things, I get inf over x, sup over y, g of x, y, minus a regret for the y player is less than equal to sup over y, inf over x, g of x, y, plus alpha regret for the x player. That's it. So I've, I've now taken all the complexity and it's all buried in this thing. And the goal was for that regret term on average to be vanishing. I just wanted the alpha regret for the Y player and the alpha regret for X player to be vanishing. And so now I have a sandwich between inf soup and soup inf. And the sandwich has error terms, which as T goes to infinity should be vanishing. And if you can find an algorithm that ensures that the X player's regret and the Y player's regret vanish, we have a proof of the min-max theorem. And constructing such an algorithm is actually not very hard. Showing that such an algorithm exists is not very hard. I mean, you could argue that if you've ever tried to prove in a class linear programming duality, it's actually a huge pain in the ass, by the way. It's like a, it's a, it's, it's like it's five lectures to prove to undergrads that LP duality. And in some sense, I've swept under the rug. How is it possible that you have a, a, re, a regret minimizing strategy? That actually takes a couple of lectures. So I, I'm, I'm lying a little bit when I say that it's so simple. There is showing that you can do regret minimization is not 
an obvious fact, but I'm sweeping under the rug the existence of these algorithms and everything else is a page. So now what I like about this, um, this argument is that it's actually not, it's not actually a proof of the next theorem. It's a constructive algorithm for the next theorem because I just showed you that a protocol generates points which sit in the middle here. Notice that there is an X bar T here on one side and there's a Y bar T here on the other side. And those points um, are constructive solutions to the min-max theorem. So I can generate an approximate equilibria, x bar t, y bar t, that essentially solve this problem with error rates defined by these two quantities, the sum of those two quantities. And um, now I have actually a cookbook for generating solutions to min-max problems. Um, and this protocol basically does that. And it tells you how, it's not only the protocol for doing it, but it also tells you that if you get upper bounds on regret for these two things, um, you, you've already proved the convergence rate. The convergence rate comes for free. And I think that's the, maybe the main point I want to make is that, um, you know, once you, if you could take your problem and shove it into a min-max, as a min-max problem and try to solve it, um, this framework kind of, you're, you're sort of done. You, you kind of can, you can, you have lots of choices for how you're going to do things. And the convergence rates kind of just come through this, this uh, framework. Let me stop there before I tell you some examples of this framework. Um, wait, wait, with the square root T? So I haven't, the square, square root T is, you mean like the regret for like whatever? It's sitting in here. I mean, it's sitting in these quantities, these like regret quantities. And I'm kind of leaving that a little bit. Because it turns out square root of t isn't always what you get. You get other things depending on strong convexity and other things. So, it, you, and in fact, it, it, we show this thing could actually be negative, which is very nice, which helps you with some cancellation. So, I'm leaving it unspecified. But yes, if you use grading, online gradient descent, you would get um, that square root of t convergence. Any other questions before I move on about that? So we don't have to do online gradient descent. Well, I, I, he does online oh, I'm going to get to, so the answer to that question is the next like 10 slides. And so, um, okay, so let me just um, tell you what, how we're going to apply this problem. Uh, let's apply this problem to something we call the Fenchel game. And the Fenchel game is defined that you want to minimize a function f. That's your original goal. So. The first thing we apply to is minimize. It's funny. I'm going to like take a standard minimization problem and, and turn it into a min-max problem, which is seems unnecessary, but I think you'll see why it's cool. I want to minimize f, and I'm instead going to look at this other thing, which is g of x comma y, which is x dot y minus f star of y, where f star is the eventual conjugate of f. Um, do you guys know what the eventual conjugate is? Should I write that? Maybe I should write that. You haven't seen this before. f star. It's called the conjugate. Uh, so if f is convex, so f is like f is convex and closed, then um, f star star equals f. So it's like a nice, it's a nice fact about potential conjugates. I mean, potential conjugates are cool. If you've ever worked with duality before, potential conjugates are very nice objects. And like the gradient of f. And the gradient of f star are actually inverse maps of each other and kind of go back and forth between points and gradients. Like the nice thing about convex functions is that for every x, gradient of f, well, sorry, if f is strictly convex, for every x, gradient of f is actually a unique point. So you can invert that map, and it turns out the inverting map is the gradient of f star. It's a very nice object. So the eventual game has these two inputs now, x and y. Um, and it so happens that it's a very easy lemma to show that if you can find a min-max, an approximate, an epsilon approximate min-max pair x and y. So I'm, if I solve this game, epsilon, I find some x and y, which are kind of epsilon optimal with respect to this game, then actually the x I get from that satisfies this. It's basically I minimize the function f. So um, it's a straightforward lemma that so, the min-max solves to this is basically a minimization of f. Um, Okay, so, 
Uh, I call this like a Mad Lib. You have like a Mad Lib um, strategy now for solving min-max problems. So you have some options now. So I, I told you the protocol. I didn't tell you. I didn't fill in the blanks. Let's fill in the blanks now. Let, for G, let's just consider G being the Fenchel game, that game I just showed you, that particular min-max problem. Um, I have to choose these weights somehow. I haven't decided that yet. Um, I have to choose an online convex optimization strategy for one player, and I have to choose an online convex optimization strategy for the other player. Um, and I also have to, and this is uh, pursuant to the question asked earlier, I also have to decide which player goes first. You'll notice that I define this protocol so that the Y player goes first and then the X player. And actually, you'll notice that it was even more than that. I actually designed the protocol so that like the X player gets to peak at the loss function for the... It, the, the X player is actually cheating in this in this particular way. I've set it up. The X player is cheating. The X player is actually seeing the loss function it's supposed to get in advance of playing XD, which seems like it shouldn't be allowed. But actually, one player can do that. If you you can set the protocol up to give an advantage to one player, um, and that's actually very useful. And it's a critical part of some of these the, 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 the techniques here that one player kind of gets a one step look ahead on the other player, and you can decide which one's which. So. Um, yeah, so you have this choice and then you have, yeah, so you have these, these choices and it turns out we can just plug in answers to these questions to, or to these choices and, 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 and see what you get. So let me just kind of give you the high level here. Um, we're going to call this the Fenchel game, no regret dynamics. And we're just going to play a game of fill in the blank um, uh, for this. And I'm, what I'm going to be able to show you is sort of, I'll be able to basically establish a bunch of classical optimization algorithms where I give you kind of one way of looking at it and then another way of looking at it, where the other way is actually using this, this particular framework. But let me just first just tell you what I mentioned online gradient descent. I, I said something that wasn't totally true, um, even though it's, I, I guess you could say, there, there's not that much variety to online learning algorithms, online confidence optimization algorithms, but there is some variety. So let me give you... I'm going to show you the types of variety in online learning algorithms that you see, um, but I will say that they all kind of end up feeling the same. So there's follow the leader. Follow the leader plays a point Z on every round, which minimizes the, the loss functions they've seen, some of the loss functions observed so far. And then there's a follow the leader plus, which gets one step look ahead. So it just gets to see one more example than it should have seen. That's a Class, follow the leader, classic algorithm for online learning. And you can prove bounds on this algorithm independently. Um, and you know, I could go through some results. It turns out this generally doesn't minimize regret if you don't have some kind of uh, strong convexity in the losses. Um, but uh, follow the regularized leader. You can also add a regularized piece, which is very common to make sure you have some stability in your solution. You can regularize that solution by adding, let's say, norm squared of, of Z in there. And that will sort of smooth out this um, follow the leader, follow the regularized leader is a, is a version of this thing. And of course, then you have the plus version, which gets one step look ahead. So plus, when I add plus, I'm just meaning you get one more example than you should have had. Um, now, I'm going to say the only interesting, in some sense, the only interesting, the thing that allows it for acceleration actually is going to be this one trick. And this is a trick that, um, well, it, okay, I'll mention the history of this trick in a moment, but Let's say you didn't get that one step look ahead. You couldn't see what was coming um, today. You'd love to be able to have one more data point. The data point for today would be very helpful. Um, but you can kind of guess, you can imagine playing a game where I actually do incorporate what I think is coming today by just as making the following assumption. What's coming today, the loss function that's coming today is the same that came to yesterday. I just assumed that I saw the loss function on the previous day. And that's called, well, I'm going to call that optimistic follow the leader, right? Where now I do the sum of the losses up until now. And then I don't know the loss today, but I'm going to call it MT of Z. And maybe you set MT to be LT minus one. And we that's this very standard trick. It's just to set MT to be equal to LT minus one. Just basically repeat the last term in the sum over here, but with the alpha T weight. Um, and of course, you can regularize that if you want, put an R in there and get this regularizer as well, just to smooth it out a little bit. Um, and that optimistic trick, by the way, seems very, it seems like a very small change to the algorithm. But actually, this is the difference between 
not accelerated and accelerated. And it's a little bit surprising. I mean, if you look at this, you think, oh, that's just a small change. How is that going to make such a huge difference? And it turns out it actually does make a huge difference. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but I'm not going to get into the bound for optimistic after all, but there were, you know, in, in the journal paper, we have sort of a, a description of, of this bound that we think is very generic that kind of brings out all the key terms in um, that you need to analyze uh, these optimistic algorithms. And, you know, it's not, this is maybe the, the hardest lemma in the entire paper um, is, is getting, is, is, is showing why this particular um, bound is necessary and also, you know, improving it. Um, but let me mention this optimism thing. It was actually goes back a little ways. I mean, Daskalakis had, um, in 2011, had observed that you could decouple these Nesterov algorithms in a primal dual way and it was actually very complicated construction, but it was really getting to this kind of optimism point. I and mean, I think he may have observed vaguely, he didn't write it like that. But then Chang et al. in 2012 um, realized that you could get a better online learning bound in terms of how much the loss functions were varying from round to round. If there wasn't that much change from round to round, then you'd get a better bound. And this idea, um, was used, was used in a paper by Rocklin and oh, I spelled his name wrong. All right, all right. K H L I N. Oh shoot. Anyway, Rocklin, he's, he's at MIT, so I feel bad doing it here in Cambridge. Um, Rocklin Sridharan, um, who was obviously a friend and a postdoc with me, and we wrote a lot of papers together and when I was in grad school. Um, so they, they were able to show that uh, uh, that this optimistic thing solves helps solve zero sum games. And it can improve the rate of solving zero sum games. And that was the first time I saw this. Um, and you know, and eventually was very excited by it. So they, they, they noticed there's a trick here that can be used for game solving. And we've sort of taken that to the max. This 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 core trick that they observed. It was for they just did it for solving matrix games, zero sum matrix games. Um, and it really is the secret sauce. Uh, so um, let me just let me just let me just finish with a couple more. Um, Online learning ideas. This is oftentimes what people, when they think about online learning algorithms, they often think about these what are called mirror descent like algorithms. Mirror descent essentially does an update from the previous ZT minus one that you had. This is sort of a one step algorithm. It looks at only the current loss function um, at uh, 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 time that you get on time T minus one, and then does a, a one step update to that. Um, and of course, you can call the op you can do the optimistic version as well. With sort of a two-step um, um, mirror descent algorithm. So this is just one more thing I'm going to need. Okay. So oh, and okay. Last last online learning algorithm, the most boring one of all, is simply to do best response. So best response says that if you get a loss function, if I get one step look ahead, what's the stupidest thing I can do? The stupidest thing I can do is minimize with respect to that loss function. So if you're giving me a series of loss functions, but you tell me today's loss function. Forget everything you saw. Just look at the one for today and minimize on that one. Because I'm trying to minimize loss, why not just do the silly thing of, and that, and that actually is reasonable, and and that is something that we will use actually. Best response um, seems silly, but actually, if you're given, if you're given, if you know what the stock market's going to be today, uh, no reason to hedge your portfolio. Uh, you simply put all of your money in the stock that is going to grow the most on that day. Um, okay. So let's play the Mad Libs, and I'm, I can see I'm running out of time. So let me um, uh, get to the point. So the first thing you can show is that just standard gradient descent with averaging um, fits into this Mad Libs framework, this Fenchel game no regret dynamics, um, where um, you're playing basically one player is using online mirror descent, and the other player is using best response. Um, and if you just take these two out, if you take the framework, Uniform weights, and you use online mirror descent against best response with a one step look ahead, then you get this classic vanilla this bit gradient set with averaging. This is maybe the most boring observation of, the, uh, of this line of work, but it's just worth observing that these two online learning algorithms combined gives you a very classical algorithm. Okay. Frank Wolf. The Frank Wolf algorithm is a more interesting algorithm. On every round, you solve, you compute a gradient of your objective function. You find the minimizing point that minimizes the product with the gradient of that objective function. And then you take a weighted average of those two points um, to get your WT, to get your, uh, uh, your, your parameters. Um, turns out that actually can be described as just doing follow the leader versus best response on this potential game objective. So that's it. 
I mean, you're, so we went from mirror to online mirror descent um, to follow leader. And that's what the Frank Wolf algorithm is. It's just, just these two algorithms being uh, applied to each other combined. Okay, let me tell you the more interesting one. Let me let me let me skip this because I'm out of time. Um, heavy ball algorithm. If you've ever seen this heavy ball, you kind of have this momentum term. You're doing kind of a gradient descent in every round, but then you have this momentum term, which is like what you how you moved last time. You then incorporate by doing a slight uh, update in the direction of um, uh, uh, you, you do this sort of continue you know momentum. You, you do momentum. You continue moving in the same direction you were before plus a gradient step. It turns out that can be described by follow leader mixed with um, uh, mirror descent. Um, and now let me tell you the most interesting thing that we found along the way, or one of the most interesting was um, Nesterov's accelerated gradient descent. And Nesterov's accelerated gradient descent is essentially the same thing as you start here, but you started with follow the leader, and now you just replace that with optimistic follow the leader. So you take the heavy ball algorithm, you can describe the heavy ball again like this, follow the leader versus all mirror descent. And now you just simply plug an optimistic fall leader. You give this thing one step look, sorry, you give the white player, you have the white player just now just incorporate a little bit of guessing into their algorithm and against again, mirror descent. And you get exactly the same. Um, if you've seen classic Nesterov's accelerated gradient descent, um, you, you actually get exactly their algorithm, the Nesterov accelerated gradient descent algorithm. And it was, by the way, a huge surprise for us that you get the same algorithm. Um, we were just playing, we were literally playing Mad Libs. And we're like, oh, that looks like that. Wait, hold on. And then we, you know, it's like maybe we can improve a regret bound and that gives you this and indeed you can. And again, it surprised me if you get a faster rate than it was, was expected, one over T squared. That one over T squared was a big surprise. Um, so here we had like online mirror descent as the second player. Um, and if you just change that to what we call follow the regularized leader, which is a slightly different algorithm, you get the what's called the infinite memory method, which is just a slightly different version of of Nesterov. Um, I feel like um, I feel like I'm out of time, so I probably should. Uh, let me just okay. I'll make one last point before I wrap up. Um, I mentioned the perceptron algorithm uh, before, which has this. You can show that the perceptron algorithm, if there is a uh, if there's a solution to uh, uh, this linear classification setting. Um, with margin gamma, and gamma just means that this gamma just means that um, you have a certain amount of wiggle room in this uh, um, in, in this problem. If you frame it as a min max problem, actually, you're trying to solve this min max problem, then the perceptron algorithm is really just online gradient descent against the best response. Best response. So one player is basically moving their w in the direction of the gradient of some loss function. And the other player is best responding by picking a point which violates that hyperplane, that, that, that half space. Cool. Once you see it this way, you can construct <laughs> an accelerated perceptron. By rather than doing a best response, you have to do some kind of a mirror descent thing. Oh, and the W player has to do an optimistic update. This is the optimistic update, optimistic um, gradient descent against a, a kind of a, a mirror descent like algorithm for the, for the P player. And um, we thought this was novel, but of course, and we found that actually many people had simultaneously discovered the exact same thing, which of course always happens in these cases. But um, it was the exact same techniques, exact same techniques that let you establish this, this faster uh, um, perceptron-like algorithm. Oh, and Raphael's here, he's at MIT. Oh, I have, to, I have to end, huh? That's what the standing means. Okay, so um, let, let me just say, um, you know, I think this is a cool uh, framework and it's been productive and uh, thanks for having me here at the uh,